Hello and welcome to the SciShow talk show, the time on SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting things. Today, we have Chad Larrabee. He is the lead head distiller at the distillery that we are, what, a half a block away from? Yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah. Um, I have imbibed your products on numerous occasions in and outside of your distillery. When, uh, when the news broke that there was going to be a distillery in Missoula, I was very excited. Uh, and you are just making how many spirits now? Um, well, I got right in front of me right here. We got the gin, we got the vodka, and we got the aquavit. Oh, that's new. <laughs> yeah, the aquavit's pretty new. I have not had that. Yeah. Um, but that's what we're bottling right now. Then we're also making an aged version of both the gin and the aquavit. Um, and we're also making a rye whiskey and a single malt whiskey. And the whiskeys take a long time. Yeah. Yep. So We got them, we got them sleeping in... 52 gallon barrels probably for the next couple of years. So your job as lead distiller, uh, you're kind of a chemist. You're uh, there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot of chemistry going on. Yeah. 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 I don't know if I could call myself a chemist. I don't have a degree in chemistry. Well, so. you don't know. You don't. I have a degree <laughs> in chemistry and I wouldn't call myself a chemist oh, because okay. I don't practice. Right. Right. Um, but you do, um, which I think is very cool. I've been down there. I've seen you still. It's very impressive. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I am, uh, not entirely, you know, I've, I've done distillations myself on a much smaller scale. Right. And I, but I'm pretty sure that what you do is a little bit more complicated than what I do. Maybe walk me through the process. Right. Okay. Um, so we start off with a grain. Um, I brought a couple samples over show here. Me, show me a grain. We've got, uh, right here. So this is the base for all of our queer spirits right here. Um, and we've got a hard red winter wheat, um, unmalted. Where's this from? Uh, we're sourcing that out of Dillon, Montana. So, a um, couple hours south. Um, just your average wheat. You just take that, throw it right in the ground, it would sprout. <laughs> yeah? Yep, it's ready to go. Um, so, what we want to get out of that, though, uh, is all the sugar that's locked up in there. Yeah. And we need to turn that from a complex carbohydrate, because all the sugar is stored as a, uh, mm -hmm. or the energy is stored as a starch. Yes, gotta... When you eat wheat, you no don't notice it tasting like soda. Right. It's not sugar. Yeah, it's not sugar. Nope. Um, but through an enzymatic process, we're actually going to break down those starches. We're going to yield out of that fermentable sugars, so simple sugars mm -hmm. that are, uh, you know, like glucose, maltose, maltriose, the big, the big three that we're mm -hmm. looking for. Um, those are one or two units of glucose. Um, that's stuff that yeast can digest, um, and they're going to ex excrete alcohol. So we're going to get a beer out of that. We're going to take that, throw it in the still. And we're going to start trying to purify it by, by removing out um, everything that we don't want. So uh, your first step is a beer. Is a beer. Yeah, we kind make a of. lot of beer. Probably don't, wouldn't like the taste of it though. Yeah, probably not. It's more like, a, it's like a really alcoholic cream of wheat cereal. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, if you want I don't to know why we don't drink that. Yeah. You That's know? probably what the first drunk people drank. Definitely. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, definitely. You know, they probably had some grain sitting around, some, some rain fell in there, some wild yeast got in, and, mm -hmm. and somebody started drinking it. Was like, oh, yeah. This is the, this <laughs> I is the ticket. I feel different. <laughs> Uh, but but yeah, good. so so once we make the beer, though, it, it's going into the still. Um, the first run we do is something called a stripping run. Um, and the it's called a stripping run because we're literally trying to strip off the alcohol. Um, and so we run the still really hot, really fast. Um, so you've got it's like a mashy, alcoholic thing, and you just yeah, want to get the alcohol out. Right, and we're just going to pump that step. straight into the still. Okay. So cream of wheat cereal, high ABV, right into the still. Um, and then we're going to heat it up. And uh, we're going to heat it as fast as we can. And everything that's going to want to evaporate is going to evaporate off. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to leave behind a lot of water and the solids of the grain. Um, what the, we, the differentiating point here being that water has a lower evaporation point than alcohol. Right, correct, yeah. So, so uh, most of what we got going on there, you know, besides the actual solids as far as volatiles go, um, you know, we got a lot of ethanol, but we got probably about 200 other compounds kicking around in there. Yeah, which you don't want. Which we don't want, but we're going to get to that later on in the process. Okay. Um, in the beginning, yeah, all that stuff's evaporating all together. Um, what we collect is something called a low wine um, or a crude spirit. And that's, you know, that's, again, something you probably don't want to drink or, you know, imbibe. For taste or for health? Both. Yes. Yeah, both. Um, probably wouldn't kill you. It'd definitely get you drunk. Um <laughs> I don't, you still wouldn't want to drink it unless you're real desperate, you know, okay. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but we'll collect all that, that low wine. Then we're going to go, we're going to head back into the still with it. Um, and to make the base for 
all of these products, we have to we have to get the purity of the ethanol up to at least ninety five percent. Um, and that requires some specialized equipment. Um, there's there's different types of distillations you can do. There's the most basic basic is the alembic distillation, um, and that's where or a pot distillation. So it's a real simple like you know moonshine still stuff like that. That's that's a that's probably the first type of distillation anyone ever did. What we have are these uh, these fancy rectifying columns, and what they're going to allow us to do is purify um, that ethanol up to that ninety five percent. So I'm basically, you're doing a chemical separation. So one of the like hardest parts of chemistry is you have a bunch, you have a, a vial full of stuff right. and you want to get one thing out of that. Right. And there are many different ways to do that. There's all kinds of chromatographies, um, but distillation is one of the original ways and that is differentiating by the boiling points of all of these different, different substances. So what is it about the rectifying column that, uh, or columns, that allows you to do that more effectively? Right, great great question. Um, so we have a plated column, um, and it, it uh, divides up the column in all these different sections. And what you're gonna see if you could get in there and take a, a temperature reading, what we're doing is a fractional distillation. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get into each one of those col uh, those plated sections and take a temperature reading, you're gonna find you know a different temperature. It's gonna get cooler and cooler as you rise up through the column. Um, and because of that temperature range in there, you're going to have a higher concentration of something that has a, you know, a boiling point at that temperature. Because mm -hmm. um, anything above that would have already condensed out. Right. Exactly. Um, and so the way our system works um, is that basically whatever the most volatile substance is in the pot, uh, whatever we put in there, that's going to naturally find an equilibrium somewhere mm -hmm. in the column. And as we remove the most volatile stuff in the system, it's going to keep kind of shifting the next most volatile thing up the column right. until we hit that sweet spot where we're getting that really nice ethanol. So the really um, pure stuff. The real pure stuff. Yeah, that's the stuff we want. So um, I'd say of everything that goes through the system, uh, if you took the total volume of it all, we're only taking out about 50% to use to make an actual spirit that we're gonna bottle. The rest of it's going to get That's recycled. Not bad. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So I mean, you're you're losing a lot of ethanol in that process. So so along the way, as you know, you're not you can't get a hundred percent of the methanol out just in a methanol fraction. You right. get methanol and ethanol. Out. Right. Right. Yeah, they have a very similar boiling point. So, yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's part of the reason why we're losing that other fifty percent. Mm -hmm. It's getting lost because it's mingled in with all these other components. Um, but we can save some of that and uh, run it back through the system and actually right. recycle some of that back mm -hmm. out later on. And then what is the purpose of having your other grains involved? Right, so we got we got a couple of different types here. We've got these two, which are unmalted grains, and we got a rye and a wheat, and then we've got the malt. Um, and so malt's pretty interesting. And the, have you ever chewed on some malt before? Do you like grape nut cereal? I do. By any chance? Give that a try. So. Oh yeah. You taste that? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're it really has that little. That little malted milk balls flavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you put some milk on there yeah. or something and go to town. Um, no, we're really fortunate that we have uh, this great malting facility up in in, um, in Great Falls, of all places, uh, that uh, makes an incredible amount of malt. Um, well, yeah, because that's where like does it, Coors has a plant up like a big thing, and we're like, lucky. Yeah, no, we get to we get to source all of our our grain um, locally, which is really important to us. Mm -hmm. um, it's great that we actually like get to take something like grain, add all the value to it that you get out of this product right here, and all the money gets to stay right in Montana. So we're right. real, we're real proud of that. Um, and then malting, yeah, I mean yeah, you don't, what, you don't what see happens? a lot of these facilities. How does malting happen? What what do you? It's it's important for making beer, obviously, because Coors owns the plant, uh, right. and it tastes completely different. What just what happened here? So if you were to chew on some of that stuff, oh yeah. Little, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> Nothing is happening. Yeah. I'm, it's like little little rocks. Yeah, yeah, little rocks. If you really get into there, it's maybe you're gonna start like getting a little keep chalky, on it, yeah. chalky flavor going on. Um, so basically, what's going on here is uh, you're gonna take if you took that wheat, you could malt it. Yeah, I got it. Nice. <laughs> um, it's not sweet though, right? No, no. There's nothing sweet there. There's nothing. It's you know you don't want to eat that. Um, and so with this malt, with this, it started off in a very similar shape um, mm -hmm. and form. 
Um, but what they do up in Great Falls, um, or what you could do you know, in your kitchen, basically, is take that seed and rehydrate it, give it some water, start to let it sprout. Um, it'll form a little tiny rootlet called a chit. Mm -hmm. um, and once you see the chit, you know that uh, that the seed has started to grow. It's actually activated all these enzymes. They're going to start breaking up uh, that, that carbohydrate, like we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. um, into an energy source that seed can use to grow out the roots and its leaves until it can get the sunlight and start photosynth photosynthesizing mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you know, getting its energy from there. Because, of course, the, the whole purpose of the seed is to both be, you know, the... the there's a little the little part that's actually going to be the plant, but it's mostly just fuel, right, for surviving until you can have some leaves. Right, right, exactly. And and that's the stuff that we're eating and that we're turning into alcohol. Right, right. We want to get that energy. So, so what the malting process does is we we activate those enzymes, which are going to help kind of complete that process. We don't actually want to go all the way through and lose all that energy by mm -hmm. allowing the plant to grow. So they they actually heat it, they kiln dry it. Um, and kind of stop that process, but preserve the integrity of the enzyme um, so that we can use it later on. We could reactivate those enzymes uh, through a combination of just rehydrating and then getting up to the right temperatures mm -hmm. um, and then finish that process, convert all that starch. And uh, So that gives you different starting starches, which how does that affect your end product? What we want to do as distillers is actually turn all of the starch into a fermentable sugar. Mm -hmm. Brewers actually want a little bit of residual sugar left in the beer to kind of give it some body. Um, and that's done, you know, through the manipulation of, of temperature for the most part, um, mm -hmm. and how long it's rested at certain temperatures. Um, what we're trying to get at, there's a couple of main enzymes in there. One's alpha amylase, one's beta amylase. Actually, people have alpha amylase in their saliva. Um, which is why if you chew grains long enough, they will taste a little bit sweet. Yeah, yeah. Sure. You're going to actually break that down a tiny bit yeah, in your you, mouth. Yeah, you're going to get, you're going to start getting these kind of longer chain sugars, um, dextrins, they're still not fermentable, but yeah, you can actually start getting something out of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's the alpha amylase kind of at work and it's kind of cleaving up this, this, this starch. And the way the starch looks is kind of like this branched little, you know, limb with all these kind of little things coming off of it. And the alpha amylase is going to get in there, start hacking off all the little limbs and branches and kind of chopping it all up. Um, and then you get the next enzyme coming in the beta amylase and that's actually going to chop it up into those smaller minutes of sugar that we can actually ferment. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, we work so hard to get drunk. <laughs> and we are all indebted to you for your, for your efforts. Uh, and now uh, Jesse from Animal Wonders is going to show us a guest, and I have no idea what it is. Jesse, what did you bring us? <laughs> a pincushion. Yeah, it's a, it's a mammalian sea urchin. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Look at his little face. Oh my god. This is Groucho. He's an African pygmy hedgehog. So they come bigger than that. They do. And you know, African pygmy hedgehog is just, it's not an actual species. It's just kind of a common name. Okay. So it doesn't really come from Africa. Oh. It's smaller than the, the wild ones you would find. It's actually a hybrid between an Algerian and a four-toed. Okay. So it, it's a four-toed Algerian African pygmy hedgehog. Yeah. They have four toes, though? There you go. Yeah, they do, have four uh, toes. Do other, yep. do all, there are hedgehogs that don't have four toes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, so, <laughs> <laughs> so these ones are the domestic kind. These are, and they also domesticate some long-eared ones, too, the European long-eared um, and the Indian long-eared. But these are the most commonly kept as pets, the African pygmy hedgehog. Um, and his name is Groucho. Hi, Groucho. <laughs> are you, how, you uh, apparently sense mostly through smell. He is, does. Is the, is the impression he, I'm getting <laughs> oh, you can hear from him. the sniffing. Yeah, let's see if you can hear him. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> so that's not really sniffing. Okay. He's not, he is smelling the world, but the noise you're hearing is not him smelling. It is actually his defensive noise. Yeah, it's like a hiss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if, you, if I touch right here, he doesn't like that. Do that. No, he doesn't like that. So the reason that he's making those defensive noises is because he's nocturnal. Oh, he's like, can I go so, back to bed, please? Exactly. So we woke him up, and he's in bright lights, and he's going to be defensive because that's that's their main defense. They don't really, they can't run very fast. They don't have sharp claws, you know. They yeah, but the covered in spines isn't bad. Yeah. When yeah. you first brought him out, he just was a ball of spine. 
Oh my God, that's cute. <laughs> Hi, buddy. I know, I know. Yeah, so. it really does look like a really big sea urchin. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I it's, it's pretty urchin. pokey. I mean, here, touch it with your bare hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty yeah, pokey. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bite, try, to, try to eat that. No, but if something did try and eat it, that's why he does the hissing, and that's why he does that little jump. Well, now he's, right. there we go, that jump. It it's because he's trying to poke him. Now, it's not like, he's not really, he's not rodent. He's not related to porcupines. Um, he's more closely related to moles. Okay. So um, he's going to have sharp little dagger teeth. Um, but these quills do not come out. Mm -hmm. They're specialized hairs, but not like porcupine where they come out when you touch them. They stay in there. Um, and you look at them, look how you see, are they, they're crossing, mm -hmm. crisscrossing every direction. When they're really calm and relaxed and not threatened at all, all of those quills will go down and it'll look like, you know, a cat or a dog's hair that all mm -hmm. goes one direction. And you could actually pet them and it'd be, you know, not smooth, but, yeah. but not pokey. So when they get uh, threatened, they're going to flex their back muscles and their two longissimus dorsis right there are going to kind of flex against each other and it's going to create that crisscrossing of the quills so that you can't get in there. And if you still try and get in there and get their soft little belly, yeah, they can just roll right up into, roll a into a ball. Yeah. And his face is really close to his bum. Yeah. Right and <laughs> stick my head in my butt. Yeah. <laughs> and sniff. Do you like to hold him? Sure. You gotta balance him on that hand. Okay. When he backs up, you have to use your other hand. Okay. Okay. So they're going to wake up at night and they're going to start sniffing around <laughs> looking for insects. And they're called insectivores. Mm -hmm. um, they're opportunistic omnivores, but they're called, they're specialists, they're insectivores. And they're going to look for different kinds of insects. Their favorite thing is worms. Mm -hmm. And they can smell an, a worm three inches underneath the ground. So it's a pretty powerful sense of smell. Did you just lick me? Yeah. You oh, are. Careful. You're licking he might me. bite. Okay. <laughs> Carefully he might bite is not my favorite thing for you <laughs> to say. Would you like to hold him now? <laughs> we can pass the, pass the hedgehog around. Um, you can see that he's waking up more. He's getting more um, yeah. used to being up. There you go, buddy. That's how I feel in the morning, too. Takes a little bit. Yeah, it's like at least a half an hour before my spines aren't standing straight up. <laughs> So he's, he's kind of like bald under under there. Underneath, you can see there's some fur around his face, and on his belly, he's going to be furred. But these guys, yeah, they live in about 70, 72 is optimal, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what I like. Nice wow. and relax. You don't have to work too hard to thermoregulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when, when he curls up into a ball, will he actually roll away if he wants to? Like Sonic? Yeah. Uh, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> um, uh, no, no, that's no. terrible news. <laughs> oh, these guys do something kind of kind of weird. Um, when they come across a new scent, they'll lick it, and they'll lick it so much it creates this foam. Yeah, yeah they're used licking you a little bit. Yeah. So he'll, if you let him, we moved him. But if you let him go long enough, and leather usually creates that effect. Um, oh, but he'll gentle. start. He's licking you. Okay. <laughs> it's start so heating soon. No, 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 gets no. this it gets this foamy around his mouth, and then they'll. Put it, turn, they look really funny. They do this really odd movement and they put it on their back and it's called anointing. So they're like lather the foamy saliva onto their back. There he is, careful. All oh, right, he has on the veins. <laughs> <laughs> on the veins, <laughs> going for the veins. Is that where he was looking you too? No, it's on the phone. Okay, okay. New people. Well, Groucho, thanks for uh, entering into the education field so that we could educate people with you. Um, and thanks for doing that cute thing that you're doing right now. Jesse, thanks for bringing Groucho. Uh, Chad, thank you for sharing your, uh, your knowledge, expertise, and grains with me. Uh, Montgomery Distillery in Missoula, Montana has lots of deliciousness if you're ever around here. You oh. said you wanted Groucho on your shoulder. Do you want to try? Yeah, let's do that. Can you do that? Yeah. Oh my god. He's poking you. Uh, he's he's, he's totally of, poking you. a lot of noises. <laughs> oh, now lick hey, your buddy. shirt. Oh, he's licking you. Oh, and he's biting your shirt. Maybe he'll anoint it. <laughs> we can only hope. <laughs> Just, oh, hey. Oh. <laughs> trying to, trying to love, disrobe love you. Love nibbles. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's got like a huge mouthful. <laughs> Do you want to try it? <laughs> That's to come good. Oh, great. Thank you, guys. And thank you for watching SciShow Talk Show. Uh, if you want to keep getting smarter with us, you can go to youtube.com slash scishow and subscribe.